civil war pitted brother against brother. Now it's bringing people together to recreate one of its greatest battles. Tough it out in the ultimate test of survival. Penetrate the unknown Amazon. Then swans. Once sitting ducks for hunters, they faced extinction. Fly with them on the comeback trail. In this submarine race, it's human power that pays off at the finish line and conquer the snow-capped peaks of British Columbia on skis. It's all ahead on National Geographic Explorer. Explorer is brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? Hello and welcome to Explorer. I'm Bob Ballard. Recently, a Civil War craze has swept the country. In our first film, Explorer takes you back to October 1864 in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley, where the Confederate Army is preparing to take on Major General Philip Sheridan's Union forces. October 20th, 1990. Valley of Virginia. Here on this land, in the closing months of the Civil War, a battle was fought. It was a famous battle, much noted at the time, but not long remembered until now. themselves reenactors. Weekends find them in places with names like Shiloh or Manassas or Gettysburg preparing for battle. Some do it as a hobby, some for the love of history, and some because they're haunted by the time when we were at war with ourselves. They are here today to relive one of the most unusual battles of that conflict, a furious clash at a place called Cedar Creek. forces is Bruce Stocky, a park ranger from Manassas, Virginia. My role is commander of the Union Army, and my rank is that of Brigadier General. So I'm in charge of all the Yankees that are here at this event. I also have to apologize for my voice. This is one of the hazards of command. While out on battlefield, even though I have couriers and staff, uh, I end up doing some yelling, and my voice takes it every time. Uh, I work with my adjutant, Major Pickett, who's next to me, uh, with lining up brigades, who's going to be where, who's commanding what, and things such as that. I have a copy on my desk right above my Macintosh computer of an 1863 Army regulations. The pacing of the camp, how the camps are laid out, position of the officers, and I use the modern technology to recreate that so when we get on site, we get out hammer and stake and map, everything is laid out precisely. And all reenactors are, are very good at this because they'll come in, they'll find their company street, they know exactly what's expected. There are tens of thousands of reenactors in the United States, and 1,700 have come to Cedar Creek. This will be a special event, a battle fought on the original land as part of an effort to protect the site from commercial development. I think I'll. All fields should be preserved as much as possible. Men came here, they fought for what they believed in, and many died for what they believed in. I don't think that should be forgotten. Not to forget or to remember accurately. That is the reenactor's obsession. The way Hollywood has portrayed the Civil War is not correct, and we're just trying to do it the right way, the way it actually happened. And that's why our uniforms and our, our, our muskets and everything else are correct almost down to the last detail. Watch your pace. 
And I think that's what that's where the reenactor fits in best is is adding color to a lot of black and white photographs and a lot of a lot of etchings and showing in the third dimension to the general public what a wall tent is, what a dog tent looks like, what a musket looks like, what what a frock coat looks like, and really uh, fleshing the image out for people so they have a much better comprehension of of what things were like then. Next formation, twelve fifteen. You're not to be gearing up at twelve fifteen. You're supposed to be ready at twelve fifteen. Hear that, first sergeant? Yes, sir. I got any questions? You want lunch? You eat it now, or you don't eat. Rick Rags, Rick Rags, march! Oh, In any unit, you can find everything from doctors, lawyers, truck drivers, blue collar, white collar, and yet they all have the same basic mindset. I think it's a, it's a. just to understand history apart from what's presented to us in the books. My family served in the Civil War, and not one, but quite a few uh, males that were able to join the Army at the time joined the Army and fought, and a few of them I know have fought here. Here, where 32,500 Union troops are bivouacked near the banks of Cedar Creek. The date is October 18th, 1864. For most of the past week, the Union soldiers have been resting. Their main opposition, encamped some five miles to the south, is a hungry, badly equipped Confederate army of about 21,000 men whose faith in their leader is beginning to erode. My name is George Hefner. work for the State of Maryland Military Department, also for Georgetown Tobacco. And today, I'm Jubal Early, Confederate Commander of the Forces in the Camp Valley Campaign. This is a big farming area for the Confederacy, actually the breadbasket of the Confederacy. We need this valley control to keep our troops and supplies coming in to help the Army of Northern Virginia carry on the campaign. By mid-October, Jubal Early faces a critical decision. Unable to feed his army, he must either retreat, a sensible move, or attack the superior Union force. Early decides to gamble. October 18th, in the Union camp, the day before the battle. Headquarters guard, I realize you've been out on the march all day today, but I'm gonna to have to ask you to stay awake most of the evening. We have very positive information that Early's troops are in the area. Headquarter guards, attention. Attention, attention. I like that. The entire camp is going to be very tired this evening. We'll need their sleep. So make sure that you are awake. I will be out checking some of the cavalry will be moving slowly into your area. The safety of the 1st Division of the 6th Corps will be resting on your alertness. In where I was early on. The Confederate force is still encamped miles to the south, but soon they will begin to move. Attention, boy. Headquarters at Belgrove Plantation, 7 p.m. The charismatic commander of the Union Army, General Philip Sheridan, is away on war business. General Wright, who has taken over in Sheridan's absence, is unaware of the impending threat. Yes, Major. I have your after-action reports that you specified for the Fisher Hill engagement. 
Very good. And I think this is to your specifications now, sir. Yes, that's, that's exactly what I wanted. Excellent. March. 8 p.m. Three divisions of the Confederate Army begin to move north. Jubal Early has decided to mount a sneak attack in the sleepy hours just before dawn. His orders emphasize the importance of silence. No drums, no rattling of tin cups or canteens, no speaking above a whisper. By half past three, some Confederate units are close enough to see Yankee campfires in the distance. Skirmishers are sent forward to overcome Union pickets standing guard in Cedar Creek. Sometime between 4 and 5 o'clock, Early's forces move into position. A few hundred yards from the still slumbering Union camp. Dawn is just beginning to break when the Confederates open fire. forces are taken completely by surprise. One rebel soldier recalled, they could not defend themselves while we had nothing to do but load and shoot. Fighting extends over a four-mile front as the rebels advance. But one Yankee brigade at the center of the battle offers fierce resistance. I'm amazed the number of people that actually stood there in a line and just kept on firing their weapons and just didn't want to take off and run. You know? Both sides, they stood there and just kept on firing at each other for what they believed in, and that to me is just absolutely amazing. Hey, Six a.m. On most parts of the battlefield, the Confederate troops advance. Me down here in our flank. Nice going, boys. Yes, sir. Thanks, nice General. 7.30 a.m. A confident Jubal Early inspects the field. By all signs, he has given the North a terrible beating. But it is still only half past seven. In Two donuts, two coffees. All right. Do you want the two coffees put into your pot there? Uh, well, I tell you what, I just assume we them in the pot. Uh, what I'll do is I'll take them like this if you don't mind. Oh, that'd be fine. Can you get two cups in there? Sure can. What kind of glass are these? These are glazed cinnamon and plain. You really learn stuff you can't learn in any books. Like, for instance, this morning, wading through a cold stream in this freezing weather and having your feet go numb during a battle. That's something you can't learn anywhere, and that's why I'm reacting. The adrenaline gets to pumping like crazy because you're 
for when you come here and, and the firing starts, the cannons go off, the adrenaline's high, you are 1860 time period. It's not like this is fun. I mean, you're really seeing this happen. So it changes your whole personality. You live that part. A lot of reenactors, they, they subconsciously let their drive for authenticity and then performing a first person slip into conversations. It's not unusual to talk to somebody, say, for instance, it was in the 8th Ohio, and uh, you'll talk about a battle like Gettysburg. Yeah, well, we were out uh, over in that field there, and uh, the Confederates, we held off a brigade. It's not until a few minutes later that you think, we, I? <laughs> no, you weren't there. <laughs> the original people were there. You were not there. Prince, we are in the 1860s, are we not? Uh, this is this uh, this is our life. This is our camp, our homes. Got to rid the world of the Yankee scum. In a historical sense, being in first-person character, yes, I, I hate the enemy. But in a modern sense, as the Union reenactors, now I don't hate the Union reenactors. I know many of them, and, and uh, I like them. As as in anything, you can go too far with anything you want to do. Uh, I don't think we've gone far enough yet in trying to reach a sense of true living history. Uh, we're, when my men march into camp, whatever they have on their back, that's exactly what they have during the camp period. For our people, identity is the key. But the most important thing is, every man will leave here today remembering Cedar Creek. They'll have an idea of what the Civil War was about, and part of our heritage will be preserved. Coming up next, go to the front lines when Civil War Games continues. Then leave civilization behind to explore the un... get into the living of history. I'll tell you honestly, we don't even realize the spectators or the cameras are out there. It's like being in a different world because you are learning through certain experiences, things that you can never learn from a textbook. The heat, the cold, the thirst, uh, what it's like to just march mile after mile after mile in, in hot wool and blisters on your feet. And we experienced the same things that those soldiers experienced. 8 a.m. On nearly every part of the battlefield, the rebels are in control and pressing forward. Make your targets, boys! Make your targets! Take a bill. But there are still pockets of Union resistance. At the center of the battle, infantrymen of the 6th Corps continue to hold their position in spite of repeated rebel assaults. When you're reenacting a scenario on an original battlefield, you're on that exact spot. You're seeing the same land forms that they saw back then. You're in the same positions that they held. And it's a very eerie feeling, but at the same time, it's, it's almost warm. And you really capture the experience of it. Slowly, inexorably, the rebels advance battering the Union lines. The enemy pushed so furiously, wrote a captain from Rhode Island, that he seemed to arrive at every place we wished to occupy. putting on stripes and assuming the responsibility. You, you have to be able not only to do the duties they did back then, but it's living up to that also.
9 a.m. More than two-thirds of the Union Army has been swept from the field. Even the six corps is pulling back, but they have bought precious time in the process. a.m. About six miles north of Cedar Creek, General Wright continues to establish a tenuous line of defense, not knowing that the battle is about to take a dramatic turn. Ten a.m. Riding south from Winchester, the man known affectionately as Little Phil Sheridan can hear the sounds of battle ahead of him louder than they should be. It can mean only one thing. His army is retreating. My first thought, he recalled, was to stop the army in the suburbs of Winchester and fight there. But for Sheridan, falling back and defending would be too orthodox. Instead, he begins to think about winning. 10.15 a.m. An aide to Jubal early records that the general's face is radiant with joy as he surveys the litter of the routed Union Army. Spurning the advice of his senior officers, Early makes a decision that will haunt him the rest of his life. He orders his army to halt. General Sheridan! General Sheridan is now on the field! 10.30 a.m. Sheridan arrives at the front lines. As his men cheer, Sheridan shouts, Come on, boys, give them hell! We'll make coffee out of Cedar Creek and sleep in our old camps tonight! A Union major remembered that Hope and confidence returned at a bound. No longer did we merely hope the worst was over. Now we all burn to attack the enemy, to drive him back, to retrieve our honor, and sleep in our old camps that night. And every man knew that Sheridan would do it. Now, without pressure from Early's army, Sheridan is able to reorganize his own. 4 p.m. The momentous hour had now arrived, wrote a soldier from New York, in which the safety and honor of the army, and perhaps the fate of the rebellion, was to be decided. A few minutes after 4 p.m., Sheridan gives the order to attack. by the fury of the Yankee assault, the Confederates fall back. Then they begin to run. Within a few hours, the Union Army had regained all the land lost during the morning. In the course of a single day, what began as an improbable Confederate victory has turned into a rout for the North a triumph that boosts Union morale 
and assures the re-election of President Lincoln. For the South, one of the last chances to change the course of the war has slipped away. And for General Philip Sheridan, a promise is kept. After a day of battle, nightfall finds his army once again encamped on the banks of Cedar Creek. Five hundred sixty nine Union soldiers killed, thirty four hundred twenty five wounded, seventeen hundred and seventy missing. In the chaos after the battle, records of Confederate casualties were lost. Today, we have all but forgotten the sacrifices those numbers represent. Land that was once paid for in blood now goes to the highest bidder. About two years ago, plans were underway to take 158 acres just outside this house and put on them 12 industrial sites. Plans were in the works to take 125 acres just to the other side of this house and put all the houses in there that the place could stand on or among or around a mile of entrenchments from the 19th Corps positions. Now, a person that buys this field out here and says, I'm going to put a housing development on it, will say to you, it's my land, I can do whatever I want with it. And I think about the 19th Corps soldier that came out of the trenches and ran past this house the morning of the battle, and he remembered afterward, he said, I never saw anywhere in the Civil War so much blood as I saw on the ground at Cedar Creek. He said the hard limestone soil would not receive it and the brown summer grass could not hide it. And when you look at ground that has been soaked with the blood of patriots, and you say, I own this land, and I'm going to get it, you are not expressing the values of America today. My great-grandfather died well over 80 years ago. But when I was out there on that battlefield yesterday, I met him. I actually feel at the time like I'm back there. It's exhilarating almost, and it's grim at the same time. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.